Welcome to Living Outside the Matrix, the show where we explore important issues that have a bearing on our lifestyle choices. And we inevitably end up turning on its head the conventional wisdom, the conventional view that we so often hear in the mainstream. Hi there, I'm your host, Nigel Howitt. And on the show today, we're going to take a look at a a uh, form of agricultural practice known as biodynamics. And with me to discuss this is Alison Bolger of the Biodynamics Association here in the UK. Alison, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today and a very warm welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Alison, could you, could you um, start off by um, telling us a little bit about yourself, um, your work with the, you know, where you are with the Biodynamics Association? Sure. Um... So I have two roles that are connected to biodynamic agriculture. One is that I work as a certification officer for the Biodynamic Association. So that's in certifying biodynamic and organic farms. And the other is that I'm a coordinator for a distance learning course in biodynamic agriculture. Right. So those are sort of my two, <clears throat> my two hats. Great stuff. So how did you um, get into biodynamics first? Well, before we start to dissect that subject, um, how did you get involved in this? Sure. Um, so I went to university in the States. You can probably hear I'm not originally from the UK. Yeah. Um, and I got a degree in science and a degree in art, which was uh, unusual, an unusual combination. Um, I then went to a place in California to study actually to be a teacher. And while I was there, I heard about biodynamic agriculture. I moved to the UK probably 20 years ago. And started to be involved with an agriculture training really as a teacher of science. So um, from the perspective of biodynamic agriculture, I was teaching science. And, and through the last 20 years, my relationship with agriculture has developed. Um, I have been a teacher of agriculture and also a farmer's wife. Um, so I have a certain amount of practice on the land. Um, yeah, and I have ended up as both a teacher and a certification officer. Fantastic. So maybe you can um, share with us, is, is there a sort of a broad overview definition of uh, or a snappy definition of biodynamics <laughs> that you can uh, share with us? Oh, let's see. Um, so the snappy definition is uh, probably either you have sort of two choices. One is the original organic or organic plus. Okay. Um, biodynamic agriculture was the first form of organized um, organic agriculture. So in 1924, the sort of principles were outlined, um, which actually predated organic agriculture. And people like um, Balfour and Howard uh, actually refer to biodynamic agriculture as this sort of the, the starting place of organics. So the principles of biodynamic agriculture, yeah, predate organic agriculture, but they also are the highest standard of ecological and environmentally friendly agriculture on the planet. So there's a uh, there's an institute in Switzerland that has looked at all of the organic and ecologically friendly agriculture standards that you can find, uh, and yeah, they published a paper that said. Puts Demeter, you at the top. which yeah, that biodynamics is really at the top. So that means we allow the fewest inputs. Um, it means it, it's for b both production, so for for farming and also for food processing. Um, it's the lowest inputs, most ecologically friendly, um, highest quality. Um, yeah. That's, that's sort of that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> Fantastic. So yeah, to give people because most people have heard of organic, um, obviously, yeah. um, as a step towards eating more healthy food as a as a means of of ensuring there are less pesticides uh, ingested. Yeah. You know, we obviously don't want to eat poison. We don't eat pesticide, no. and unfortunately, the reality of it is that most of us do eat a lot of pesticide, glyphosate. You know, all these uh, nasty yeah. things. 
Yeah. So um, am I right in thinking then that it was uh, it sort of stemmed from Rudolf Steiner? And uh, can you can you give us a little bit of, of, the, of the history there? Because he was uh, sure. he was a big educator and, and philosopher, wasn't he? And philosopher. Yeah. I mean, I think it's primarily in a way from his philosophical perspective that we would connect biodynamic agriculture. But it's certainly also he had a lot to say about many different subjects, including education and history and agriculture. In 1924, which was relatively late on in his life, um, farmers and growers and vets came to him asking the question, and this is in 1924, so this is before um, before many pesticides or herbicides or fertilizers, artificial synthetic fertilizers were used, already the farmers and growers and vets were seeing an increase in disease and a decrease in resilience, both in animals and also in plants and seeds. Mm-hmm. So they came to him sort of uh, as someone who <clears throat> knew a lot about a lot of different subjects, uh, including growing because that was part of his experience growing up um, and said, we're facing this, we're facing this decrease in resilience and we don't know what to do and we'd like some help. And so out of that, he uh, considered the subject for a while and then gave um, some lectures in 1924 in May that really outlined the principles and some of the methods of biodynamic agriculture. Um, from then on, Im- almost immediately, people started taking up the practice and also researchers started doing research on the methods um, and how they could best be applied. So since Yeah, basically since 1925, 1926, there have been biodynamic farms. There are now biodynamic farms all over the world um, on every different continent. Um, And yeah, people have been working with it and also trying to research what's the best way of going about this. Fantastic. That sounds really interesting. So um, can you delve in there maybe to a little bit of some of the core principles um, of, of uh, biodynamics? I mean, obviously, we've got this parallel with, or- with organics. It, it predated it. Perhaps you can map out some of the basic principles. Sure. Um, so it, if I talk about production, mostly about growing, um, the principles are certainly to le- to care for the soil plants animals and human beings all four that are involved in the the process of producing food um, and to do that in a way that we are always leaving the soil for example better off than we found it so that's one thing is care on all of those levels, including on the human level. So often with organic agriculture, there's, for example, the, the principle of care for animals and extremely high um, animal welfare standards and care for the soil and care for plants. But often human beings are kind of left out of that equation. They've been, Indeed. Um, that's more a fair trade kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, whereas biodynamics tries anyway to take all of those into account and to recognize Recognize that a healthy, um, a healthy farm or a healthy garden involves the health of the human beings who are also working there. That that really has an influence on the the farm itself. Absolutely. So, I mean, sorry to interrupt you there, yeah, but um, just just talking to uh, to um, uh, somebody about the eating wheat, and he mentioned uh, that uh, it, it's uh, the development of wheat strains has not taken into account their effect on the human consumption. And as yeah, you said, it, exactly. it, it just requires requires that broader context awareness doesn't it okay we, yeah. we may be doing things to grow food and and even as you say addressing the, the health of the soil and, and the plants but what about the end product and and that's where some even even um you know some plant uh, what, what, what's the word for strains of plant development when you cross breed and all that sort of stuff yeah. it doesn't actually take into account the sort of the increase in lectins in wheat for example um you know this was uh, yeah. this was dr william davis that i was talking to a few weeks ago that was mentioning this Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Please carry on. No, that's okay. Um, no, it's absolutely, that's, you know, the, the point of biodynamic agriculture is to produce high quality food that supports human beings in, in their lives yep. um, and in their capacity to develop and to participate well in the world. So that's really the aim. 
you know. And at the same time, that needs to be done in collaboration with nature and working with nature rather than against nature. Absolutely. So nature is a very generous thing. You know, you can – anyone who has a garden – Garden, you can look out and see exactly how generous the weeds are. <laughs> the, nature grows, you know, um, and if we can work in a way with nature rather than against it and with that aim of high quality food, that's really the sort of fundamental principle of biodynamic agriculture. That's taken to some details, like a farm, for example, um, aims to be, isn't always, but aims to be self-sustaining. So only a certain amount of the food for the animals can be brought into the farm. The aim is really to create a harmonious, well-balanced whole so that the nutrients from the animals go back to the soil, the soil feeds the plants, the plants are encouraged in their resilience and create food for the animals and it becomes a sort of self-sustaining um, organism unto itself. Right okay so it's, it's, it sounds like a sort of a model it's looking at the model of the natural model isn't it looking at the natural world looking at the context of, of the reality we see around us and 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 uh, and following the success of, of, of these systems that work and, and interact as, as you say. Very much so. So, for example, if we look at ecological systems, one aspect of resilient ecological systems is always diversity. Yeah. That's one of the things you always see. Um, monocrops don't exist in, <laughs> in resilient ecological systems. Um, so, diversity is always seen as a good thing on a biodynamic farm. You don't just want to be growing only corn or only wheat or only soybeans. You need to have animals, you need to have plants, you need to have soil, you need to have human beings, and you need to always be trying. It's a bit like um, the conductor of an orchestra, trying always to harmonize the different aspects of, of the farm and to aim for really high quality life for the soil, the plants, the animals, and the human beings, and the end product is high quality food. I assume with all that, then um, we, we've we've looked at the diversity, the the broad uh, contextual awareness. What we're trying to do here, you know, the the nature of food growing involves animals, plants, and, always, and, and the soil. So of course we have to be cognizant of of the needs of all of those to keep them healthy. So what about the um, the, the the inputs and things? Because obviously modern agriculture, in in its haste to make things more efficient. Um, it's highly reliant on it, inputs. It very, very <laughs> reliant on, on inputs and mechanization and so forth. So, so how does yeah. biodynamics view all that? So we're certainly not against technology in principle and in practice. I don't think many biodynamic farmers would want to give up their tractors for anything. Um, however, we are interested in taking a long-term view rather than a short-term fix. So if there is um, a problem on the farm, for example, with disease or um, with nutrient imbalance, the, the ideal is that you look for a long-term harmonization rather than this is what's going to fix it for the season. So when you look at the standards, the standards don't allow synthetic fertilizers, for instance. Um, they don't allow synthetic pesticides or herbicides. There are some uh, sort of less synthetic things that biodynamic farmers will use. And a lot of them are really aimed towards building up resilience and nutrition on all levels rather than, um, yeah, a short term sort of fix. Okay. So, yeah, so there, um, I don't know whether that answers the question. Yeah, yes, it, yes, but, it kind of does. But, so, you know. so what about things like, um, you know, applying lime to the soil and, uh, you know, I mean, I, I run an um, organic small holding um, here in Hertfordshire, um, three acres, and, and we, we use things like the fire ash and we, we compost everything. We compost piles of wood chips and... Yeah. Um, and, and uh, we keep pigs, chickens and geese. So, so we obviously factor in their manure as, as well. It, it, supposing you, you were to go out and sort of uh, um, get some, some, some mineral product that was carved out of a mountain somewhere. I mean, is all that considered a legitimate input to try and increase the mineral content of the system? It depends a bit on the, on the situation. And before anybody did, did want to to use an input like rock dust, and some of some rock dusts that are naturally occurring are allowed. 
Um, we would need to see soil tests so that we know that there's a real need for it. Um, and, and also the hope is if it's a nutrient imbalance, for example, that there is a longer term plan in place to address the nutrient balance. So when you look at a biodynamic farm, usually you look at the animals and the balance of the animals with um, the overall soil area, the overall acreage, um, and ensure that there is enough nutrient coming from the animals to feed the soil and there are enough plants coming from the soil to feed the animals. So to try and yeah, create that as a balanced whole rather than this is a short term thing. However, we, you know, there are some difficult soils that are lacking in certain nutrients. And yes, we would certainly look at how you can resolve that in the most natural way possible. Okay, so um, <clears throat> if my farm was uh, was all clay or something like that, and I needed to I needed to go twenty miles up the road to 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 get something to to alleviate that, I mean, that that would be fair game, wouldn't it? Um, it would, but you would need to do it in discussion with us. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. So um, with the um, with the the, the the process of of registration and um, certification. Um, is, is that a growing phenomenon here in the UK? Can we can we uh, you know see see people catching on to this idea? Is it taking root? Do you think? Um, I think it is taking root, and certainly our licensee base is expanding uh, year on year, um, both on production and on processing, and also on trading and distribution. So, as I said, there are biodynamic farms all over the world, um, in every continent, and uh, some people are uh, very active in bringing those products in so that they can become available in the UK market. Um, but we also have a lot of producers within the UK, and those producers actually on the whole sell almost exclusively in a direct marketing relationship. So either they have a farm shop or they have a CSA or yeah, in one way or another, they sell through a very short supply chain. Okay. I think it's, the statistic is something like 80% of our producers, of our farmers and growers sell directly to their um to their consumers Custom, so they yeah. have a very direct relationship and that means also that the consumers know the farmer and know the farms and um, a lot of those farms are community farms so people are really welcome onto the farm and and um, are welcome to participate in the farm as well. Yeah I should say for the listeners that CSA is a community supported agriculture I believe. Yes yeah. sorry um, a box uh, many of them have box, box schemes yeah. a little bit like Abel and Cole or Riverford uh, where they supply vegetables on a weekly basis all year round. So I guess biodynamics more supports um, the I think more optimal model of, of more locally produced food so you have smaller, smaller scale producers, but catering to smaller markets. So it's appropriate and, and In a way, yes. smaller supply chain that you mentioned, I think. Yeah. Um, I mean, certainly we're interested in keeping supply chains short and um, and as human an interaction as we possibly can. But there are also some wonderful biodynamic wines that are grown in South Africa that I'm really happy get imported into the UK. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so you know, we recognize local local is really good and when possible it's great. But there are things like tea and coffee and wine that sure. um, are are more difficult to locally produce, although we ha also have some really nice biodynamic wines that are available in the UK as well. Absolutely. I mean, an international trade around the globe is a good thing, isn't it, for producing wealth. Yep. So we grow our food wisely and, and, and perhaps, uh, you know, exchange it or trade with others that hopefully do the same in other parts yeah. of the world. And it sounds as though people are doing that from what you say. I'm fascinated with, um, with you mentioned earlier that your your uh, start off point was was very scientific. You have a scientific science degree and you have an art degree, sort of a, a nice balance there. But so your your approach into biodynamics is is very science orientated, um, and, and and I, I share that. I'm I'm quite a rational approach sort of person. I'm you know evidence based and, and all that sort of thing. So. What about things like um, companion planting and um, it's correct me correct me if these are, are not biodynamic principles um, planting in in cycle with the moon uh, have I, is that a biodynamic principle yes and, and, and is there is there any science for for these um, you know these recommendations so um, 
taking account of where the moon and the stars and the sun are um, is one of the methods of biodynamic agriculture. Um, it's not as it... It isn't a required method, so we don't require that our growers, for example, plant on the right kind of day, but um, but the sowing and planting calendar is something which can support both gardeners in their back garden or growers on a more um, production scale. Um, there has been, as I said, people started to research uh, biodynamics pretty early. I think by 1928, there was certainly a research group in place. And I know that there were some researchers working in the UK, as well as in other parts of the world, in the United States and Germany and Switzerland as well. Um, there is a certain amount of research that supports using the sowing and planting calendar. Um, but the other thing that I think is important to understand about biodynamics is that uh, each each place where growth is happening, each production place where either it's a farm or it's a garden, it has a, it has a unique aspect to it. So it has a certain ecology, it has an, a certain influence from the weather, it has a certain soil, for example, it might be clay or it might be incredibly fine tilth silt. Um, and each of those needs to be taken into account in this building of a harmonic whole. So um, we do see that each farm is unique and each farm needs to adapt to its circumstances. Um, clearly, the weather has an influence. The sun is an obvious influence. We all know that growing is based on the sun and most animal rhythms are based on the sun as well. Um, extending it to the moon and the stars is is not unique to biodynamics. Actually, the farmer's almanac has been around for a really long time, taking into account the moon. Um, so yes, it is one of the, the sort of methods that biodynamics supports, um, but it's also left up to the individual. Okay. So I have a friend, for example, who he, I mean, he's a, he runs a garden down in Sussex and he does aim to use the sewing calendar as much as he can, but he also needs to make it practical. So if he has those days to plant potatoes for the for the year, then he uses those days and he tries to plan it out, but it may not always work. So it's not a requirement, but it is one of those things that can be supportive um, of how you focus your attention. Yeah. And I think that's also really inter that's that's really vital to biodynamic agriculture is because you're not looking at short term solutions, you're looking at longer term solutions. It needs careful observation and careful understanding of what all of those different aspects of the farm are. Yeah. Um, so you need to when you look at your cows in the morning or your sheep during lambing time or you need to really be able to observe and clearly see. Uh, how their health is, how their resilience is, how happy they are, you know, are they, yeah, yeah. what their real condition is. Um, mm -hmm. I, so I love that's that. a really important task for a biodynamic farmer. Yeah, yeah, I, I like that because uh, um, th there, there are some that, that maybe view biodynamics as um, – as a bit, you know, mystical, a bit spiritual, and 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 that's that's fine for people that want to to bring that in. But it seems to me, um, I, I'm not that way inclined. I'm more of a rational man. But I love the way biodynamics just it, it seems to just take into account context, doesn't it? And it's so important it for, for everything we do is, is context specific. You could say that all knowledge only exists in context. There's no such thing as knowledge out of context. And 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 this this you know sort of a, comes a, into alignment with uh, becoming more conscious, doesn't it? If we're more conscious yes. of the, all of the aspects of growing food or of any any particular activity, but in this case, growing food, looking after the soil, making sure the end product isn't isn't actually toxic for us. Um, you know, all of these things. It, it's all about really seeing a big picture, isn't it? Seeing everything yeah. interconnecting, and uh, that that sounds fantastic. And that's really vital to biodynamics to see all of the interconnections. Um, to see all of the systems which are intertwining. And, and as it turns out, in nature, those often are complex. They're not impossible to understand, but they do take attention and they take observation and they take a lot of consciousness. Yeah. So when you're, yeah, when you're looking for a long-term solution, you then have to think about all the different aspects of that long-term solution and how they can best be harmonized or how they can best work together. 
Absolutely. I remember reading, um, I think it was uh, in a book by Chap, an organic uh, production book. Um, I'll, I'll put the name of it in the, in the show notes. But uh, one of the principles was to always take notes, was to always record. And uh, I've been I've been growing food, um, you know, broadly along organic biodynamic principles for, for about 20 years. And, and uh, <clears throat> I regret that I've never really developed a disciplined <laughs> strategy of taking notes on what we do because of course you know the, the scientific method is to sort of do something observe what happens and then you know if the wrong thing happens don't do that again do something else I mean that's a very yeah. simplistic approach but it's pretty fundamental also you know I I remember 20 years ago when the, when it was all fairly new to me walking around a farm with a bunch of fairly experienced biodynamic farmers and recognizing that we saw all the same things. I saw the same field that they saw mm -hmm. um, and it looked exactly the same, but they understood it differently because their experience had been built up for so long that they could see, oh, at the bottom of the hill, it, you know, the the crop looks like this and at the top of the hill it looks like this and where are your nutrients and where is your soil and what's the soil they could make sense of it in a way that I couldn't at that point because I didn't have the experiential education basically just from having the experience of seeing something and then working through it and understanding it and reflecting on it and they had a huge amount of experience that just enabled them to understand the world and nature differently than I did so I had a lot of sort of tech technical knowledge. I understood photosynthesis and I understood, you know, nitrogen fixing and all of that from a sort of biochemical perspective, but I didn't understand it from a practical and an experiential perspective, how to deal with it and what to do with it, which they did. Right. So, um, so yes, I think that, you know, observing and reflecting is really a fundamental thing about how we work in the world but certainly if you're working with nature and you're working with producing food then it becomes even more important. So is there any overlap between um, biodynamics and permaculture for example um, and no doubt you know about permaculture we've chatted about permaculture before on the show um, and, and that that seems to have a, a number of principles broadly in line with what you're talking about is there any overlap? Yeah I think there is um, in fact um, I had a conversation with Nick Lampkin maybe about six months ago, something like that, and I think he phrased it incredibly well. He He's the head of the Organic Research Center at Elm Farm. He said, look, you know, organic, biodynamic, um, permaculture, holistic management, all of those things, we basically share about 95% of our DNA. In terms of the principles, we pretty much all agree on what needs to be done. Cool. Um, if you look at something like permaculture and biodynamic, uh, there are some methods that are different. But I have, I also have a friend who has a training in both permaculture and biodynamics, and he sees it sort of as a toolbox. You know, you have your understanding of what it is that you're doing, and then you have a bunch of different tools or methods that you can use to work in the situation and use the best one that is applicable for the situation. And biodynamics has some methods to offer, and permaculture does as well. But certainly there's a huge amount of overlap, yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> permaculture has really focused more on education, and biodynamics has sort of focused more on production. Um, but yeah, as I say, we have a huge amount of overlap and there's just kind of different tools that you can use in your toolbox. Absolutely. I agree with that. And it seems that uh, that all of these um, methods, all these, um, is that the right word? Uh, <laughs> they all have the, the they all have their, uh, you know, beneficial principles. And, and yeah. in many ways, they're applicable to life in general, aren't they? You know, as I mentioned with this context thing, you know, the broad, yes. the more we can be consciously aware of, uh, usually that serves us. And, uh, and it's the well, same. And to to try things out like holistic management and mob, mob grazing for example a lot of biodynamic farmers i mean mob grazing really comes from the african continent and observing what happens in nature uh when ruminants are are grazing on grassland okay so, do, do you mean by that do you mean a, a, a sort of a temporary huge overstocking where, where a, a herd yeah. would come in and chew everything down and then move on and then move on and that allows the grass to recover using the nutrients that the ruminants have left behind they move on to another grade they graze it down quite quickly and then move on so some farmers are starting to imitate this 
for example, in the United States, in Africa, and, and some in the UK. And there are biodynamic farmers who are using that as a method because they're curious as to whether this thing, this system in nature which exists on the African continent is applicable? Does it work in the UK? Is the compaction rate going to be too high for us actually? Because that's more of a problem in the UK than it is in Africa. Right. Um, or is this also going to work with English grasses as well as it works with African savanna? Right. Um, but that's an experimental process. It's a method that people are really interested in and they're trying it out to see how it works and whether it works for them in their situation. So, you know, the principles that were that those methods come from are really overlapping and we have yeah. a huge amount in common. We, but with biodynamics, you have to figure out what works with your ecology, your soil, your plants and your animals and your people. Yeah. So um, soil, soil compaction, again, just in case anybody doesn't doesn't understand that the idea of too many, too many animals on one space can, can sort of compact the soil down, can't they? And, and, and does yeah. that have a negative effect on, on how uh, crops subsequently grown on top can root down into it? Yes, definitely. If the soil becomes too too um, hard for roots to penetrate well, then yeah. that can sacrifice the plant resilience on the plants that grow on that soil. So it's it's a balancing act always. You know, you need your fertility and you need it on the soil. And in order to get the fertility on the soil, it either needs to come from composting animal manures from the barn or uh, from the animals trotting on the soil. But that means that there's compaction happening and and can have positive or benef uh, or negative um, influences on the soil when they're on it. Yeah, brilliant. So, so, so to sort of zoom out for a moment, then I mean, I, I'm I'm seeing biodynamics as as a as a way. I mean, the ultimate goal of it is to further the well-being of us people um, by eating healthy, wholesome food. And in the process of doing that. Um, it's naturally in our best interest to look after the soil, to look after the plants, to look after the animals, to make sure that the whole ecosystem um, works nicely together. So, so we're basically, as humans, we're sort of overseeing, aren't we? We're, we're, we're providing our, our ability to be cognizant of the greater situation, to, to manage it, uh, ultimately for human well-being. Would you agree? Um, I would say yes for human well-being, but also... Um it's it's pretty fundamental to biodynamic agriculture that somehow we as human beings take responsibility. And so we domesticated animals and plants 10,000 years ago. It isn't possible for us to just give up that responsibility. It We, have, we exist um, in collaboration with nature at our best when we're doing really well. Um, and so we as human beings take responsibility for the well-being of ourselves, but also of nature and realize that one shouldn't be sacrificed really for the other, but that it's possible to, with enough consciousness and attention, that both really thrive. And Absolutely. I think that's really the aim. So. For example, also in biodynamic agriculture, you have to have, it is part of the standard, you have to have 10% biodiversity reserve. So there, not only should the farm be diverse in in its own right, that there should be animals and plants and, and those should there should be a certain variety in that, but also that wildlife actually isn't just pushed to the sideline of the farm, that it's really integrated into the farm. Okay. That's... that's one of you know do, do you mean so, do you mean wild spaces you know patches yeah. of nettles perhaps um, you know yep. people might relate to that in their garden a patch of nettles for the for whatever insects benefit from nettles yeah, that and I can't... butterflies and yeah. bees and making sure that our our bees are supported um, that wildlife in general is supported and that it becomes not an adversarial relationship but a collaborative relationship absolutely yeah and it seems to so, so, go on well, I was just going to give one example. There's there's a, a wine farmer in South Africa that we visited a, a few years ago. Um, he he had these weeds that were growing in amongst the vines, um, and they're they're sort of dandelion ish kind of plants, bright yellow flowers, um, and roots that go sort of tap roots that go down into the soil. <clears throat> and there's a pest that. Um, is prevalent in that area of wine growing in South Africa and feeds on the vines. Um, and he figured out at a certain point that actually if he allowed these dandelion-like plants to thrive, then the pests weren't such a problem. Okay. 
at a certain point, he dug one up and he figured out that all of these little caterpillars that usually feed on the leaves and roots of the vines were feeding on the dandelions instead. So if he allowed a certain amount of sort of weed nest to grow, then he could actually uh, reduce his pest problem um, and, and balance the whole system. Brilliant. So it's things like that that we're really looking for. Mm -hmm. Solutions like that are, are what we're really looking for. I mean, it's clear with things like pollinators, we all need bees. You know, yeah. we'll, we won't have an apple crop unless we have bees. But in order to support the bees, we can't just grow apples because that's only a short space of time. There need to be other plants as well that they can feed on. So it's that kind of really trying to look at the whole system and how everything can can be supported to be resilient yeah i guess that's again the, the essence of a companion planting idea isn't it the fact that yeah. uh, some plants just do well um in, in yeah. close proximity to each other and there can be a whole number of reasons why they have this sort of synergistic uh, effect on yeah. each other and and they're both better off as a result of being next to each other Absolutely. And at the same time, then less of the soil is left uncovered. That's almost always a good thing. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, things like companion planting may not work at a sort of uh, production scale. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, but certainly at a garden scale, that's an excellent thing to do, where you can really work with the resilience of two different plants that support one another. Wonderful. So um, just aware of time running away with us here, a couple more issues. Um, do you, is the biodynamic uh, association involved in any uh, sort of campaigns to restrict and limit the use of glyphosate, for example? Um, you know, glyphosate being a, a, a very, very widely used uh, and particularly nasty substance. It, it, it allegedly it, it doesn't doesn't uh, hurt humans directly. But, um, you know, the, the information is emerging that uh, it, it's an antibiotic for a start. So we're tipping antibiotics into the soil and then, of course, yeah. killing the bacteria which are, and all the other microbes which are fundamental to the soil health. So, so is there, um, you know, some sort of uh, campaign? Are you involved in anything? Can we share anything to the listeners about that, that concern? Yeah. Um so we're not actively on our own involved in any specific campaigns against, for example, glyphosate or any other um, pesticides or herbicides. Um, but we do we do both biodynamic uh, certification, but we also do organic certification. So we're part of the organic certifying um group which mm -hmm. works together on things like that so we work with the soil association and of and g and off and um the organic research center we're we're involved in a number of groups that are actively um working to limit uh harmful things yeah absolutely <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, we're involved, you know, we're involved in discussions with Michael Gove about the role that organic agriculture can have after Brexit, for example. He's been talking a lot about the green, the green Brexit and that it may be possible to have higher environmental standards. We don't really know what that means yet, but we're involved with those discussions yeah. um, with government as well yeah. as policy. Michael Gove being our um, current agriculture sector agricultural secretary i believe yeah uh, yeah. yeah so i mean i'm personally very interested in, in a campaign against uh, um, glyphosate that's the the, the um, pesticide herbicide fungicide <laughs> bacteria side that i'm most familiar with um there's another one uh, his name escapes me at the moment but it seems that a, a broader awareness all round is required isn't it we the public need to 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 get to a point where we are all sufficiently taking uh, account of the greater context to know that we can't trash the soil with the we you know with this roundup yeah. and, and all these other well and and other things like um the overuse of antibiotics i mean that's that's a big deal especially in agriculture yeah. uh, in conventional farming systems because Absolutely. animals tend to not quite have enough space or not quite have the right kind of food that often means that they need antibiotics at a very high rate once those antibiotics get into things like the water system and the soil then microbes become um resistant to those oh sorry the phone no is problem. ringing <laughs> I'm so sorry. No worries. Somebody will. Somebody else will answer it. Just, <laughs> I okay. forgot to turn it down. All part um, of the sound effects of the show. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and and as we know, antibiotic resistant um, microbes is really an issue, and a lot of that comes from farming. Yeah. So 
on on every systemic level, there are a huge number of things to become aware of. And I think that's part of the difficulty for consumers is what do I pay attention to now? Do I pay attention to plastics? Do I pay attention to antibiotics? Do I pay attention to animal welfare? How can I possibly take into account all of these things all at once? And that I recognize as a real difficulty. Also from a, I mean, I'm also a consumer, obviously. <laughs> um, so I I look out for certain things and I pay attention to certain things and I don't always manage. That's how it is for a consumer. But there are a lot of things to be aware of. If you are looking for something like organic or biodynamic food, then a lot of those things you can trust that somebody else has already looked after. So you can know that no glyphosate was used in the production of your food. Mm. You can know that no endocrine disruptors are going to get into your food. You can know that the the environmental consequences of the food being produced are really minimal, if not actually a positive um, influence on the environment. Those are the kind of that's the nice thing about looking for organic or biodynamic food is you don't have to think about all of those things so much. You can just kind of go, okay, I trust that those people are looking after this for me and I'm really happy with that. Sure, yeah. So from there then, um, how can consumers, um, you know, find out about uh, where they can get hold of biodynamic dynamic food? Because I, I must confess, um, you know, I know about yeah. organic, I buy organic, but I don't see much um, biodynamic uh, certified no. stuff oh. on the shelves. Well, as I say, uh, a lot of our producers sell directly. So that's one of the reasons you don't see it in, in grocery stores. Of course. Um, and even in, health, in independent health food shops, there's not a huge amount out there. But there is some. Um, the thing is you have to – so one thing is you need to look for a Demeter – label. So Demeter is the certification label um, for biodynamic food. Okay. That's one thing. Uh, the second thing is you can go to the Biodynamic Association's website in the UK and we have a map of where all of our producers are. Okay, A great. lot of those producers have farm shops and that really, I mean, we have always support that as a sort of direct relationship. Um, the, the producer and the consumer do really well out of that because there aren't any middlemen to take any cuts of anything. Um, <clears throat> cuts down on food miles and it works both for the consumer and the producer. Sure. So that that's one thing to do. Um, there are certain places that do biodynamic food online, and you can look online specifically for Demeter products or for biodynamic food. And some of those are also on that map, which is on the Biodynamic Association's website. Um, you can also drop the Biodynamic Association an email saying, uh, where can I get this near me? We're still in the process of developing a list of all of the retailers that, that actually carry Demeter produce. That's one of the tasks that we're working on at the moment so we hope that we'll have a more fulsome list soon but in the meantime those would be two things to do fantastic i think it's my yeah. turn to have a phone ring now. <laughs> 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 we'll just ignore so for that example, one, of our, one of the farms in the southeast um and and they primarily produce meat they've just started an online business they'll ship Demeter meat all over the UK. So you can order it online, you can get it sent and, and it arrives at your door. And it's really good meat from happy animals from great farmers. Fantastic. I, I know them personally, so. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. How do you spell Demeter then? Demeter is, is, the, is the word, is, well, what's, is it in a round symbol? How, how does that work? So uh, Demeter is the word D-E-M-E-T-E-R, as okay. in the goddess of okay. uh, fertility and agriculture from from Greece, okay. uh, from Greek mythology, the mother of Persephone. Okay. Um, and it is, it's actually usually an orange label with a green stripe at the bottom and says Demeter in white letters. Um, if you go either to the Biodynamic Association website or to bdcertification.org.uk, you'll be able to see what the logo looks like and what you what you need to keep an eye out for. Great. Can you just remind us of the um, URL for the Biodynamics website? I will have all these details in the show notes, I hasten <laughs> to add. But just for any listeners, that, um, is it biodynamics.co.uk? Yeah. No, no it's org. biodynamic.org.uk. .org.uk. Great stuff. Yeah. 
Yeah. Excellent. Well, uh, what a fantastic overall picture of, of biodynamics. I mean, uh, I, I've, I've wondered about it for a while. As I say, I think there's a growing number of people who are, are interested in, in wholesome food and, and a wholesome environment. Um, for our best health and everything and, and this sounds like a, a key part of the puzzle so uh, yeah. thank you so much uh, Alison for, for taking the time to, to share your knowledge and perspective on biodynamics with us today that's fantastic you're very welcome it's been a pleasure great stuff and uh, I urge um, any listeners to, to take that up and to check out the website um, um, as Alison suggests there and indeed all the details in the show notes as I mentioned earlier and thank you very much for listening And I do hope uh, that you'll all join me again for another episode of Living Outside the Matrix.